This time of year, as we're approaching the off-season, it's perfectly normal to hear new theories just about every single day by hockey insiders. Theories of where they think NHL players may end up, whether it be through a signing or via trade. But today, we're not really here to talk about which theories make the most sense, but rather the ones that kind of don't. And with that, here are four proposed destinations for players that don't make a lot of sense. So it doesn't take a genius to figure out that Ken Holland is going to have his hands full this offseason. While taking a quick glance at Cap Friendly here, we can see that quite a few players are already pending free agents. Starting with the forward group, Evander Kane seems to be the biggest question mark. Since there's actually still some unfinished business to be dealt with regarding Kane and the San Jose Sharks, it's really hard to tell what could happen by next season. According to NHL insider Elliot Friedman, who appeared on the Don and Dollywall show here recently, due to Kane's grievance being filed, it is possible that his contract could be reinstated with the Sharks after all. As crazy as that sounds, it's not out of the question. And while there is the potential for his contract to be reinstated, it really seems far-fetched to believe that San Jose's management wouldn't try anything and everything in their power to keep Kane from rejoining the lineup. However, in an article from The Athletic, given that Kane's situation is very unique, one of the listed possible outcomes is that Kane could finish out his contract playing in the Bay Area. I'll definitely link the article below since the situation is quite complicated, but if the grievance situation isn't resolved by July 12th and the buyout window closes, the only other option would be to trade the contract. With a three-team trade list still hypothetically effective on his contract, you'd have to think that Kane would be willing to waive it if need be, since multiple Sharks players reportedly said that they don't want him to rejoin the team. Also, it's pretty unlikely that San Jose will be a contending team next year as well. The contract isn't the greatest and bears a cap hit of $7 million a season, but it'd be pretty careless for the acting GM not to try some salary retention to ensure that there won't be another locker room disruption. Ever since the Toronto Maple Leafs were dealt their latest first round exit, there's been many questions about the team and how it will look by the start of next season. And one of, if not the top issue that GM Kyle Dubas will be busy addressing this offseason is the goaltending position. Since Jack Campbell is set to hit free agency, the Leafs are going to be looking for a number one starter first and foremost. The list of potential answers for Toronto's net so far has featured John Gibson, Marc Andre Fleury, and also interestingly, Matt Murray as well. Now, one thing we're definitely not here to do is to bash the two-time Stanley Cup champ. Not hardly. Murray will always have those accomplishments backing him up that commend a certain amount of respect. However, when TSN's Chris Johnson decided to speculate that the Leafs could possibly have interest, many didn't quite understand the fit. For one, Dubas and head coach Sheldon Keefe are going to be prepping for what could be potentially their final season with the team. Therefore, there's a very small margin of error that's going to be allowed. Secondly, it wouldn't make a lot of sense for Dubas to bring in Murray for a top role. Even if the cap hit was cheaper and not $6.25 million, it wouldn't be the right situation for Murray to be in. Knowing that he was sent down to the minors last season and put on waivers, would throwing him in net in the hardest city to play in really be the best thing for him? Even still, it's very hard to tell what Murray's future holds. He could be bought out, maybe traded, or could finish his career out with Ottawa. But it seems like a stretch to assume that Murray will soon be seeking redemption between the pipes as a leaf. When it comes to the Jonathan Tay situation, it's another one that seems to be quite complicated. After he was able to return to action following his battle with CIRS, it quickly became clear that not only had things went down from an organizational standpoint for Chicago, but the captain's game had done so as well. Definitely not here to knock on a player that's battled hard to overcome an illness, but knowing that the NHL is first and foremost a business, any trade value that the forward had declined substantially. With only 37 points and 71 games played, Taze averaged just over 17 minutes of ice time for the first time in his 14-year career. With that being said, there's no doubt that at 34 years of age, Taze isn't still a great leader and carries those valuable intangibles. But 
he's still not the player he once was. Therefore, whenever Jimmy Murphy from Boston Hockey Now theorized that Taze would be able to fill in for longtime captain Patrice Bergeron should he retire, well, this seemed to be overly optimistic. However, it has been no secret that Boston has been weaker down the middle than it once was and could use some reinforcements. But one, this was assuming that Taze would want to waive his no move clause and go there. Secondly, that Boston would be open to taking on the contract. And lastly, that Taze would fit in culturally. Since we do know that Brad Marchand and Charlie McAvoy both will be missing some of the season's starts and that Bergeron may not return, would it make sense for GM Don Sweeney to try and trade for Taze at this point, given that he's in the later stages of his career? Seemingly, it wouldn't, but I guess you never know. Pretty much every offseason for a while now, we've been hearing about the potential of longtime Calgary star Johnny Gaudreau being traded away from Alberta. And while there definitely was reason to speculate, and there still is up to this point, some of the proposed landing spots for the 115-point scorer seem a little far-fetched. In case you're not familiar with Gaudreau's present situation, the forward is coming off of the best season of his entire career, with 40 goals recorded and is also a pending UFA. Knowing that Gaudreau definitely earned a sizable raise, Johnny Hockey could easily command 9.5 to 11 million a season. Even though we never heard much from Calgary's GM, Bradshaw Living, what we do know is that the GM has been adamant that he wants to keep Goudreau on the team. While the desire to stay in Calgary seems to be mutual between GM and player, there's still that small chance that they won't be able to settle on the right dollar amount for the next contract. And for the longest time now, the assumption is and has been that if Goudreau were to relocate, it would be to the East Coast. Since Goudreau was born and raised in New Jersey, it's been theorized that he would attempt to play relatively close to his hometown state. So when NHL insider Pierre Lebrun speculated on a Gaudreau seattle Kraken connection, well, it didn't seem as plausible. From the angle of cap space, first and foremost, yes, the signing would make sense. Outside of that, nothing else would. You have a player in his prime with cup aspirations that would prefer playing on the other side of the continent, if not in Calgary. Also, there's going to be potential openings with the New Jersey Devils, Philadelphia Flyers, and New Yorks that are all miles ahead of what Washington State has to offer. In my opinion, I'd even go as far as to say that it'd be more likely that Gaudreau would sign with the Buffalo Sabres over the Kraken. Sabres probably won't be a cup contender for a while, but Buffalo still is a lot closer to where Gaudreau would like to be than Seattle in the end.